Good morning. Good, morning. Good, morning. Good morning. Greetings to you all and welcome again to Zion Lutheran Church. It's a joy to have you here this morning in God's house together. Our worship is going to be according to service setting one found on page 154 if you're following in our hymnals. Um, and our service is continuing the theme of rethinking religion. This morning we're going to be rethinking the worth of worship. And we'll begin our service with the opening hymn, 912. Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, 
save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant us, Lord, the spirit to think and do what is right, that we who cannot do anything that is good without you may, by your help, be enabled to live according to your will. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The Ten Commandments teach us that God is to be worshipped above all. Why? Because he is the God who brought us out of slavery. Our lesson from Exodus chapter 20, beginning with the first verse. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. We sing together Psalm 19c.
Whatever it is that you trust the most, that is what you truly worship. Some worship intelligence, others worship power. May we worship Christ for all he did for us on the cross. Our lesson from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Please rise for the works and words of our Savior. His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Glory, praise, and honor to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus restores his Father's house to what it was supposed to be, a place of worship for all people. Our Gospel according to St. John chapter 2. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money, uh, coins of the money changers, and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. Lord Please again be seated for our hymn of the day, 558.
Dear fellow redeemed, person A never attends worship because they don't see the point. Person B, on the other hand, they attend very regularly but only out of a slavish obedience. And while they're there, they view the tasks of worship just as a list of things that need to be accomplished, and their heart's not in it. Their mind drifts off during the worship service. They're thinking about so many other things. Rather than debating which of these two is worse off, let's just at least start out and acknowledge that there's a problem in both cases. Let's admit that neither understand the worth of worship. And that is what Satan wants. To focus our study this morning, we're looking at John chapter 2. And in it, we read the context. It says that the Jewish Passover was near, so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. This important detail tells us that Jesus was in Jerusalem, and it tells us the time there at the Passover. This was the highest festival out of the entire church year. People were pouring into Jerusalem from all over, even countries away. They were going up there to celebrate and to offer their sacrifices. Celebrating this Passover festival was such a big deal that most people would make their plans a couple of months in advance. They needed to plan out where and how they were going to get their animals, and they needed to plan out their their final lodging accommodations. As all these plans and preparations were being made, you can understand that business was good. People were coming in from far away, and there was loads of people, and along with them, they were bringing their coin purses. The idea of buying an animal for sacrifice close to Jerusalem was a very big convenience for them. After all, some people were traveling hundreds of miles, if not even further. And the idea of trying to bring an animal all that way would have been a huge hassle, to say the least. Even worse than that, if somebody attempted a far enough journey, it could be that an animal got injured along the way. And then it wouldn't have been fit for sacrifice in any rate. And so it was that the people were pouring in from all over, They were bringing their money with them. And normally it used to be that you would get your animals a couple of towns away. As you were nearing in on Jerusalem, you could go to one of those neighboring towns and buy an animal for sacrifice. But as the time went on, they decided to make things a little bit more convenient. And so those vendors actually put themselves in Jerusalem itself and they lined the streets. This is, in a a sense, a bit more convenient for people because they had less of a distance of travel from that cellar to the temple. Until finally we get to our lesson in Jesus' day, things had progressed even further still. Now the streets of Jerusalem were no longer lined with those vendors. Now they had come right to the very temple in the outer court of the temple, and it was the Gentiles' worship area. This caused many problems. Things were crowded. They didn't have the space for all those money changers and vendors and all their animals alongside all those worshipers, especially not for this high festival when they needed so many animals and there were so many worshipers that were present for this festival. The crowds were one issue. Another issue was the noise. Again, you can imagine, people were clinking their coins on the table. They were haggling over prices. Then there was the noise of the animals themselves that added in above all the rest. Then there was also, doubtless, the smell. And not just the smell of the animals, but also the smell of the messes that they made, some of which couldn't be cleaned with a broom, but you also needed a shovel. 
And really picture this. This was the worship area for the Gentiles. This was their church. This was the closest that those Gentiles could get to God. On the highest festival of the year, it was noisy, it was crowded, it was smelly and dirty. And this was supposed to be their, their worship experience? It wouldn't be much different if we ourselves decided to, to pack up and go to a state fair and, and pack ourselves into, uh, into a barn there. And with all the animals and livestock, imagine what kind of worship experience we would have in that situation. It wouldn't be nice. This was the scene that Jesus came upon. And our lesson tells us in the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. But it was even worse than all of that. Because this was a tourist trap. Again, those foreign people brought in their foreign currency. And as they did, there were money changers there for the sole purpose of exchanging money. They were quite happy to take your foreign coins and convert them into their local shekels. And in that way, you could then go and buy your, your animal there at the temple. Then as you took your local shekels to go and do some haggling over prices, you would find that those prices were particularly high because they could get away with it. Because they knew you had just traveled such a long way and that this temple mount was about the highest thing around and were you really going to turn around and go back down the mountain in order to try and find some other vendor elsewhere for a better price? They knew that you weren't going to do that. So they could charge about whatever they felt like. And then, we're almost done. At that point, if you got your animals and you still had a little change left in your pocket, and you thought to yourself, well, I can't use this, this local currency back home. Well, those money changers would be more than happy to help you out again and change it back into your local currency again on your way out. You can understand the abuse. You can understand why later in his ministry, because this was uh, towards the beginning of Jesus' ministry, but at the end of Jesus' ministry, he came to that same temple in that same outer court, and he called it a den of robbers. He described it very accurately. And you can also see that as this incident happens at the beginning of his ministry, and a very similar thing happens at the end of his ministry, we also know that they didn't learn their lesson. And so, as Jesus came upon this scene, he was upset. And so he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple, uh, from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle, he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he said, stop turning my father's house into a market. Jesus dealt with them in an appropriate manner. Some of those animals needed a little prodding, and the people too. Jesus couldn't have just gently and passively said, oh, well, you know, I don't think this is a great idea, guys. They already knew it wasn't a great idea. They just didn't care. Now this scene in particular is one of those scenes where it gets us to pause and ask that question. Is anger sinful? After all, it seems like Jesus is getting angry here. So is there something wrong with that? Well, let's acknowledge that anger is a human emotion. And an emotion like anger isn't in and of itself something sinful, although you can understand it certainly could lead us to sin. Ephesians chapter 4 says this, In your anger do not sin. But the implication is that it is possible to become angry and not sin. Anger itself, then, isn't a sin, although the Bible does warn that it can certainly lead to sin. For example, after asking Cain why he was angry, God warned him and said, Sin desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Genesis 4, 7. 
Again, back to our incident with Jesus and those money changers and those vendors. This is a classic scene of Jesus being angry. Although I do find it interesting that neither in this account nor in the other accounts that happened later in his ministry, we don't read the word anger. What we read instead is this word zeal, that he was zealous for the Lord's house, which is to say he was passionate and serious about God's house and God's worship and about giving those Gentiles a proper place where they could come and hear God's word and quietly pray and take some time out of their day and their week to be close with God. In our own anger, we should be careful to come to a conclusion. When the world rejects God's word, or when people hurt other people, or if somebody sins particularly against you, our anger might seem righteous. And in fact, it might be righteous. But what determines the difference between righteous anger and sinful anger is really just our motivation. Often our anger comes from hurt pride, from being inconvenienced, a feeling of superiority, or a desire for revenge. We may think our anger is righteous, but at the same time, we need to remember that the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Jeremiah 17, verse 9. So if you are feeling angry, it's helpful to stop and ask that important question, why am I angry right now? Are we angry? Are we angry at something because it would also anger God too? Or are we angry because we simply feel hurt or wronged? Or because we're looking for vengeance? In those times, we need to even remember that Jesus tells us to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Matthew 5, 44. We do need to be on guard against sinful anger. But the biggest issue we see in this, in this lesson, I think, it really isn't about anger, although that's certainly an important one. It's just, in general, about worship and about what's the focus of our worship. Those money changers and livestock vendors, they were there to do business. And business, humanly speaking, was very good. But spiritually speaking, it was awful business. This was... Bad business. Because they had lost their entire priority of why they were there. This was God's house. This was the place to get close to their Savior. This was the place to hear God's word. And they had become so busy with trying to turn a shekel that they didn't care about any of that. Not only did they lose out for themselves, but they were also damaging the worship experience of the others who were coming in. They were harming those Gentiles in that outer court. And they knew better. I find it pretty telling that as Jesus did all this, as he made that, cor uh, that, that whip out of cords and drove them out, what was the response Notice that they didn't say, Jesus, you shouldn't have done that. Jesus, that was wrong. No, what they said was, Jesus, can you show us a sign? And can you prove to us you have the authority to do all this? There's a big difference. So they actually didn't tell Jesus that what he was doing was wrong. What they actually just said was, do you really have the authority? I think perhaps it's an indicator that their consciences were pricked. That they knew full well that what they were doing wasn't right. So they didn't even try to defend it. As for ourselves, we certainly can devalue worship in our lives too. We can imagine that it doesn't really make any difference whether we're here together on a Sunday morning or, or a Wednesday afternoon or evening or whatever other time. We can imagine that it's no big deal if we're never in Bible class or if we don't take that time to do family devotions at home. 
we can imagine that, well, my worship really is between me and God and shouldn't be between anybody else. But that's not true either. The fact is that God has given us pastors and church leadership to keep track of us. But even those average members sitting right next to you right now in the pews, they are there too to help you remain accountable and to keep you growing spiritually. So if suddenly one of those members isn't coming, we need to be asking, is everything okay? And is there something we need to do to help you stay connected with God and his word? Is there some way that we can help you grow closer to your Savior? This is the responsibility of everybody here. It's why God gives us his church. On the other end, there are people that might be, be attending church every single week, but for the wrong motivation. They might have amazing church attendance. They might volunteer lots of hours, be in Bible class, and give a, a large portion of their income in the offering plate. And on the outside, it all looks great. But again, it still comes down to what's the motivation? What's in the heart? And if behind all that there is this desire to earn points with our God to try and get him to smile at us and approve of us by our own good works, it's never going to be enough. We're going to find that the guilt doesn't go away. The fear is still there. And the shame is still felt. If it's based upon us and what we do, we will always come up short, no matter how good we are. No matter how well off we are, even in comparison with anybody else in the room. Because ultimately, deep down, we know God calls for perfection, and we just can't hit it. In all these things, we have a Savior. In all these sins, we have Jesus, who freely and fully forgives every sin. He's the answer. And as we see him drive out those money changers, sellers, and animals, we see his heart for true worship. True worship keeps God as, as the focus. It keeps a repentant heart that earnestly seeks pardon from our Savior. We also see how Jesus would be that Savior for us. How he himself would suffer that punishment just outside those Jerusalem walls. And he took the sins of the world on his back. He carried them. He was nailed to that cross for those sins, each and every one, and he made that full payment. He bled and he died. The payment is done. It was made in full. And then on Easter Sunday morning, he rose again. He came out of that grave and he left it empty and proved that that payment was enough. So we don't need to keep trying to pay in installments. We don't need to try and add in any way to what Christ has already done. So there is no more guilt, no more fear, no more shame. We simply run to God in prayer and repentance and say, Lord, I'm sorry, please forgive, and he does. But then, right then, God also says, rise again and live a new life. Live the life that I wanted for you from the start. A life that honors my name. Today we celebrate the victory of Easter Sunday because it means we're on good terms with God. It changes our outlook on life here and now and our outlook for eternity. We want to worship the God who would love us that much to give us such rich blessings. We want to let others to know how they too can also find sure salvation in Christ. And so we stay connected with God's promises. We gather together around word and sacrament, and the Spirit moves in us to love and trust in God above all things. Moved by the cross of Christ, we bow down before our God and commune with Him. That's what God wants. Living like that, we can value this privilege that we have in worship, and we see that its worth is priceless. 
Nowhere else could we receive such rich blessings from God, and yet they are all ours to enjoy today as free gifts in Christ. Amen. Please rise. Now may that peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep and guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We then confess our common faith in the words of the Nicene Creed together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please again be seated. We pray. Heavenly Father, you loved the world and gave your Son to free us from sin and death by his obedient death on the cross. Lord of the Church, we thank you for the treasure of the gospel. By your Spirit, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Guard and guide those who carry a cross in the name of Christ and face ridicule and persecution for the sake of the kingdom. Missionaries and chaplains, young people who stand up for what is right in the pre face of pressure to do what is wrong, and all who pay a high price for their faith and values as Christians. Keep in your care those who carry heavy burdens in life, the sick and the chronically ill, the depressed and the lonely, those torn by conflict in personal relationships, and those victimized by war and injustice. Comfort all who face the terrors of life with a heavy heart. Watch over those who care for others, pastors and counselors, physicians and nurses, so social workers, and caring friends. All who feed the hungry, comfort the hurting, and stand beside the dying. Hear us as we pray in silence. Help us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Keep us faithful even to the point of death, that we may receive the crown of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Please rise. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil who overcame us by a tree would in turn by a tree be overcome. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. We give thanks to you, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate Word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we glorify and honor you, O God our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please rise. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it, you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please again be seated for our closing hymn, 558, stanzas 7 through 10. Greetings again to all of you in the name of Christ our Lord. I want to remind you that this morning, there is no Sunday school this morning. We do still, however, have our adult Bible class for those who wish to attend. Um, also, we have continuing opportunities uh, on Sunday the 25th through March 24th um, to help out with the ESL classes for the uh, Venezuelan asylum seekers. Um, there's more information in your bulletin and you can contact either Claudia or Sue Drolly and, and find out some more information as to how you can help th those efforts. I also want you to know that there is an upcoming Easter egg drop. That will be the day before Easter. And so we're collecting over the next several weeks uh, candy and eggs to stuff. Um, please give all donations by March 17th. And there's currently a box in the rear entryway. I'm not sure if it's going to stay there or if it's going to move to the front. But one way or another, if you bring in some candy and some eggs, 
we will collect them for that event. Keep in mind also our upcoming LWMS Spring Rally. Uh, offerings are due by the March 24th, and uh, this year's rally will be on April 20th. Read through the rest of your announcements, and God's rich blessings go with you throughout your week.